Okay. So I will share my screen. It's ah, it was a weird sound, but it stopped, right? Sim, foi o João Bahia que entrou. Eu já desliguei o microfone dele. Força, ah. Sara. Uh, so, hello everyone. Uh, olá a todos. Uh, my name is Sara Prush. As Anna already said, I'm a Portuguese architect and currently a PhD researcher at the TU Delft, the Netherlands, on the design principles of affordable collaborative housing. Uh, today I'm here to give you an overview of the defining features of a subfield of collaborative housing, namely the new cooperatives that are emerging in Europe. Um, so over the last decades, and in face of the current economic, housing and climate crisis, many segments of the population began to follow a more conscience and needs-based uh, premise towards life and consumption, where less is all we need, where access of goods uh, overcomes the idea of property and where collective rules over the individual. Also, concepts uh, such as slow living, degrowth, collaborative or sharing economy are regaining momentum today. So all these ideas are also being applied in the specific field of housing. So the conventional modus operandi of housing provision, uh, more top down and without including the end users in the process, is being challenged by a more inclusive, resident led and collaborative model where everyone is actively involved. Uh, this represents a paradigm shift in housing provision and management. Uh, the role of residents change who no longer are mere consumers. Uh, the role of professionals change, uh, namely the architects, and the role of institutions change. So housing becomes a process and a product of true participation, of co-production and co-design, where doing with dominates over doing for or doing to. So along with this idea of planning and developing together, People are also willing to live together as a community to extend the idea of collaboration and cooperation to the living environment. And this is what describes the concept of collaborative housing, which is the umbrella term that includes a wide variety of collective self-organized housing, such as the new housing cooperatives, or better, the, the renewed version of housing cooperatives. And indeed, in the past decades, we've seen an increasing number of collaborative housing initiatives spread all over Europe. These new cooperative housing models are characterized by their alternative provision and governance systems, by their alternative ownership models and alternative spatial layouts. They encompass the above mentioned notions of collaboration, co-production, co-design and collective living. They are often the combination of a bottom-up approach where the residents themselves are the ones who initiate the project and lead the process and a strategic top-down support, namely by municipalities and not-for-profit institutions. These cooperatives are therefore collectively self-organized, self-managed and collective decision-making process is based on non-hierarchical structures. This way they represent an alternative to the way housing is conventionally designed and delivered. Municipalities and banks play an essential role in this collaboration. Subsidies, incentives, granting access to land and revising the regulatory framework are some of the examples where public entities may contribute. And we've seen many ethical banks or the so-called green banks granting the loans to these housing cooperatives. Participatory titles or loans and grants are additional financial strategies uh, to guarantee the necessary funds. Here are examples of first, uh, some updates of the legal framework where the concept of cooperative housing was introduced or reintroduced in housing related laws in many European regions and countries 
and where some rules were established for the creation and management of, of these cooperatives. Uh, and second, several public incentives for, for their promotion. I'm sure Adria and Just can, can talk about this uh, with, with more detail. Now, regarding ownership, here we have uh, the ownership models we are familiar with. So the conventional private ownership uh, where households uh, where household buy, uh, buy the property and the common rental system, public or private, market or social, uh, where each household, the tenant, individually pays the rent to an external landlord. The cooperative model allows for a, a wider variety of options uh, that are somewhere in the middle, where in principle, you neither buy nor rent, but you are granted with access to housing. So there's the cooperative ownership model where the land and the building belongs to the cooperative. Uh, after the construction is completed, it keeps the cooperative status and the property stays in the hands of the cooperative. This represents a big difference if we compare to the traditional housing cooperatives uh, where housing is privatized after the construction is completed. Something that was very common in Portugal, for instance, in the, in the 80s. Uh, here, the residents are members and shareholders of the cooperative. They buy a share or membership and then they pay a monthly fee. This way they receive the right to occupy one unit for as long as they want, as long as they don't break any of the rules or regulations uh, in a non-speculative and stable manner. And this is because there are restrictions on the eventual resale of shares, like in limited equity housing cooperatives. Uh, then we have the grant of use or session of use model, which gives the right of the member to occupy a housing unit for free or in exchange for some sort of economic or in-kind compensation. Then we have the cooperative rental, where the cooperative is either the owner or it rents the whole building to an external owner. Uh, either way, the cooperative is the landlord and manages the rents. This way, the residents have more autonomy to collectively self-manage the building, uh, which in, it, in turn may increase the sense of belonging, social interaction, and even reduce the management or maintenance costs. Uh, then we have situations where cooperative ownership is somewhat combined in the same building with social rental or rent, rent to buy models. Uh, this is often the result of the cooperation between these groups of self-initiators and municipalities. Uh, another variant that is also the result of the cooperation between residents groups and public entities is this one, where public land is made accessible to cooperatives to build their project through leasehold agreements, for instance. In this case, land and building are detached. The property of the building belongs to the cooperative, whereas the property of the land belongs to the municipality. In these cases, residents usually need to be eligible for social housing. And then there's a similar strategy with the so-called community land trusts, uh, which are being mainly used in the US, UK, and Belgium. So a CLT, community land trust, is a private nonprofit organization or corporation um, that buys and holds the land on behalf of the community in order to keep it out of the speculative market uh, and therefore keep it affordable on the long run. Uh, now, as for the last point, the idea of sharing and living together as a community has repercussions on the architecture layout. So many design decisions differ from more conventional housing solutions. And here are some examples. For instance, here we often see small units complemented by collective spaces, uh, which leads to alternative um, topologies, some design strategies to increase social interaction among neighbors and with the wider community. Uh, there's also a growing concern for more uh, sustainable construction systems. And finally, the understanding of housing as a constant and growing process and not as an end product. Um, here are a few concrete examples. Um, maybe I can pass them uh, quickly to give the floor to, to the next speakers. 
but these these are, for instance, Barcelona. Adria will talk about this. But this is to show that there are a wide variety of of, of ways of developing um, these these kind of projects. Here, the, a cooperative in Berlin, uh, financed by this green uh, bank, as I mentioned before. And to to finalize. Uh, we know that this is not a, a solution that fits everyone's profile and that will not solve the, the systemic uh, housing problem. But we know that it opens up a range of new tools for the provision and management of housing. So in the specific context of Portugal, this renewed version of cooperative housing has the potential to present solutions outside the speculative market, especially more appropriate and with a strong sense of community and sustainability. So thank you very much. And now I'll give the floor to Adria, who's gonna guide us through uh, the process of developing uh, the cooperative La Borda. I will stop share now. Thank okay. you so much, Sarah. So Adria, you have the floor. Yeah, obrigado. Boa tarde a todos. Um, Yes, I'm, I'm Adria, and I'm. Let's see, I'm going to be presenting you our experience at La Borda. Uh, share screen. So, do you see something? Yes. Great. Um, so, yes, let me put the, the timer so I, I'm sticking to the time. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be sharing uh, the example of, uh, I would say I will talk about La Borda, but basically keep in mind that this is a whole movement that's going on across Catalonia. Catalonia is the, the country that is on the other side of the Iberian Peninsula. Um, and yes, um, I'm, I'm a member of, of La Borda and I'm also a survey designer who was also a technical uh, support of the, of the project. Um, today I'm going to be able just to touch um, some of the uh, um, yeah some key idea, which is just building houses to build community. But I'm going to share the, the presentation with you so you can see a bit of all the things that we also working, which is um, making sure that this happens in the frame of the right to housing, so that um, it's not just a solution for the happy few and that uh, that we put effort as well, and not just building uh, buildings, let's say, but also. Uh, fields of, of uh, say affordable housing. So also to pay attention to the into how we build the field. Yeah, I'm gonna be quickly Barcelona. This is the city of Barcelona. La Borda is in Sands. The Sands is um, uh, it's a historically uh, working class neighborhood um, from 150 years. The first strikes and things like that happen in this neighborhood. And one of the textile factories um, that was in use uh, ended up not in use, and then it was bought by the municipality and so on and so forth. And there was uh, a huge multi-platform uh, process uh, that uh, after 20 something years managed to get uh, in collaboration with the, with the municipality at that time um, to start self-managing this huge complex. And La Borda, uh, it, it basically spore or spin off from um, the housing committee. Um, there were committees for economy, for different things. Um, so basically, yeah, La Borda is not a mushroom, but basically a mycelium that it's uh, placed uh, in this neighborhood and in this particular platform of Cambadio. This is a picture of the community, um, 50 something people, inter intergenerational and so on and so forth. And yeah, just some, some general um, idea of the whole process. 2011, um, the, the Cambadio platform got into the, into the building with the agreement of municipality. First uh, committees start to form and then um, the housing committee starts to research for options and things like that. Um, and they do some prior work uh, up until 2014 where they generate a um, status basically like some sort of like uh, uh, document um, of the future B cooperative. They reach a, a verbal agreement with the municipality at that time, um, center right pro independentist, let's say, and they they um, 
uh, also make a, a, a architectural uh, early study, let's say. And then they make, a, there were at that time nine units and they make an open call for everyone in the neighborhood who would like to join the project. Um, and that's where, let's say, the second phase of, let's say, all the, the tailing <clears throat> and, I'm sorry, tailing and, and many other details and things go up until 2018, where uh, we moved in, let's say. Um, our main preferences are, yeah, like uh, many of them that you might know from Midhouse and Syndicate, from the Almine uh, model in Denmark, but, all, but mostly from Uruguay, <coughs> Futukam and Fekobi. If you don't know them, uh, do check uh, these this, uh, this references. Um, and yeah, this is the building of La Borda from the two sides of the, of the, of the project. Um, and basically what we, La Borda, let's say, uh, it became like a, like a flagship uh, example of the, the, this new model uh, that, that started to explain. Uh, it's built on, on different, uh, let's say, concept or pillars. I, I can see myself, I can hear myself now. Maybe somebody changed something anyway. Um, so not for profit collective property and kind of use so that um, the, the owners of the homes are, it's the cooperative and, and it's basically not allowing to speculate with. Um, and if you leave the building and somebody comes, it's not you that does it, it's the cooperative that does it, so on and so forth. It's affordable, stable on time, uh, in time and, and flexible in the sense that it allows for, for changes. Um, it's community driven and focus on uh, low, low impact lifestyles and particularly important as well is within the frames of the social and solidarity economy, which basically uh, in La Borda was, I think it was around 70% of the whole budget was spent through cooperative union banks, um, co cooperative architects, cooperative designers, cooperative uh, lawyers, cooperative, I don't know, all this kind of stuff. The, the wood comes from a, from a cooperative, the elevator from, come from a cooperative and so on and so forth. Um, so these are a bit like the pillars, and you also asked me to to hear a bit of how we organize. So here's a bit like uh, it's in Catalan, but maybe you can read it. Um, how we organize basically through a set the Laborda leading the way and through different uh, committees and and technical support, um, and of course not just these um, formal cooperative, but many other public institutions and neighbors and, and so on and so forth. And I will explain a bit later also in the financial scheme, but La Borda, let's say it is what it is in the sense of now we receive many awards and all this kind of stuff, but it is what it is because a whole, I don't know, city or a lot of people kind of decided that we needed a kind of flagship project to, to show that, that this was possible and to, and everybody, let's say, supported us. This was the field, and I'm just going to show some pictures of the process that, of course, as Sarah said, has been participatory. This was the, the inauguration of the construction process, some pictures of the space, um, passive house. Here now there are some uh, um, solar panels, self-construction uh, to remove cost and create community. Um, yeah, shared laundry and shared common services. Um, also dignifying uh, care reproduction tasks. Some of the apartments. This is my apartment. Actually, you can see the picture of uh, when we got the, the MRI of our first baby. Um, some other apartments. Rosa and Elena here. This is the party. Yes. and. Basically, you also ask us to, to touch a bit into the, um, the finance, how we manage to finance it. Um, we uh, build up the relationship with uh, COP 57, which is a, a credit union that is also based in our neighborhood, um, where we manage to have different uh, types of, um, of finance instruments. You can see here the, the examples. Um, I will highlight one of them, which was the participatory loan. Uh, that managed to, uh, um, to uh, sorry, the participatory titles that managed to raise uh, 865,000 euros in 14 days, 
of uh, titles of a thousand euros, you could get up, up to 20 titles. Um, and, and it showed that actually, um, yeah, like the biggest part of our financial scheme uh, was from um, the, the community that, that thought that uh, not just because I think it was, I would say now from memory, two point something interest rate. So it's, uh, it's not too high, but it's also a lot more than what the banks give you if you just put it or make it sit in their, in their accounts. Um, but it showed that basically not just fi it made financial sense for them, but also that they thought that it, yeah, that that that, that we were trustable and that they was we were something that that they wanted to to engage with. Um, and I think that's the the most important part um, to show that that these things uh, have a community behind that. Um, financially wise as well, like Laborda um, in twenty something years we're gonna stop you know, pay back the, the, the loan and the interest and so on. And also by, by status, we have this agreement that we're going to keep paying um, our current um, uh, monthly fee so that uh, by the end of the 75 years, which is the land lease period that we agreed with the municipality, we're going to have uh, more or less the, the money for two more buildings, which means that if the community that is living at that moment wants to move out, they can do it. Uh, but also in the meantime, that we can be banks for other cooperatives so that we can be uh, replicating agents. Uh, and yes, um, here's a bit of like the example of how uh, the whole paying back, it's, it's organized. Um, it's now 10 minutes. Um, if it's time within this hour that I can share a bit more, um, I can do it. But for the now, just uh, thank you and obrigado. Thank you so much, Adrian. So now I give the floor to Just. Yes, uh, great to be here. Uh, thanks for the invitation. My name is Just Engerink. I live in Amsterdam and I would like to share a bit more of the story of the Vara. So I'll go to share my screen as well. Do you see it full screen now? Yes. Yes, yes, yes we do, yes. Great. Um, also really interesting um, <clears throat> presentation from La Borda. Um, they have been a huge inspiration for us as well. So we're a bit later in the, in the process. Um, the Vara is about sustainable, affordable and cooperative housing. Uh, who is the Vara? This is the group. So we are a group of young people, a lot of creative people, a lot of people who earn their money uh, as a musician or as a dancer or um, in theater uh, and a, a group of people who struggle to find affordable housing in an extremely expensive city like Amsterdam, uh, but is vital to uh, the dynamic of the city. So the Vara, what, what, what does it mean? The Vara is, Warren is uh, the English word for uh, a rabbit uh, hole. So it's really that idea of collectiveness, connectedness between different people. Uh, there's three values we have. They are here in Dutch, but it's we want it to be sustainable, uh, sustainable, collective and affordable. So these are the three values that we really strive for in developing the project. Uh, the Vara is located uh, in a newly created area in the IJsselmeer, a big lake in the in the Netherlands, close to the city of Amsterdam, um, and you can see with an arrow where it's located. So, as Sarah already introduced, uh, there in the Netherlands, there a new housing law was passed in which the concept of a housing cooperative was mentioned as a legal entity, and the city of Amsterdam, with a quite a progressive uh, government really took uh, that uh, on uh, that idea of uh, housing cooperatives, developed all kinds of policies uh, and support mechanisms for it uh, and started to uh, tender uh, for different proposals. And we as a group of people, we wrote for, in for the tender and handed in a proposal and, and actually won that proposal. 
but it's part of a bigger policy, as I said. So in the coming four years, we see another 13 tenders come online. And the goal for 2040 is to have 40,000 new houses in Amsterdam built uh, uh, as a housing cooperative. Uh, and in the Netherlands, in general, this is a growing movement. Also in Nijmegen, Almere and Rotterdam, they are actively working on creating a housing cooperatives with support from the municipality. So this is a bit of our timeline. We started in 2016, so a bit later than La Borda. Um, and we won our tender in 2018. So then we really started with the project uh, and um, started also designing with our architect. Uh, and now at this moment, we are actually uh, halfway uh, with uh, building the, uh, the, the, the project. So it's not yet finished. Then the question of financing, um, housing cooperatives in Germany and in uh, Switzerland are, are much more common. So we didn't find any Dutch bank who would finance this. So we found the GLS bank, which is a sustainable bank in uh, Germany to finance um, uh, the building. Uh, but we also looked for additional funding from uh, uh, different loans from the municipality, from uh, the province, the region. But we also launched a big crowdfund where about 115 people uh, could get um, yeah, an obligation. So they could invest basically a part of their, their money in the Valle. Uh, and there were a lot of people involved in that and we managed to raise quite a lot of money. And that means that people actually get to interest on that uh, uh, over seven, 15 or 20 years. Uh, so that's also a way in which we finance the building. Uh, our team uh, consists of course of our group of 50 uh, future inhabitants, but also nature fighter, uh, architecture architect, who has been crucial in also organizing uh, all the practical uh, building uh, uh, stuff with us and with the uh, construction company. A big part of the process was the co-design process. So we're a collective of 50 people and we went from developing a concept and a vision to a more final design in five months and eight design sessions, which were very interactive uh, and also together with the architects so that that really helped to co-develop that design. So here are the, some pictures of, of that process, which was great fun, but also very useful to talk about values, to talk about uh, what do we like to see in a building? Uh, what atmosphere do we want? So it was very, uh, very useful. This is a bit of an overview of, of uh, what kind of spaces we will have. Uh, I won't go to, into them in detail, but what you can see is that the list of actually the, the, the living apartments is much shorter than the list of all the collective spaces. Um, so we made a conscious decision to make one third of all the building a collective space. So that means that we really chose to have a lot of uh, um, collective space to be together in, to eat together in the evenings, um, to do activities together. Um, we have a, a shared roof terrace, we have a, a, um, a theater a room, uh, we have a co-working space, we have an atelier, so it's really a place where all that creativity can come out and people can inspire each other. Then a bit about uh, the building, so very often in collective buildings you will put the collective functions on one floor and then the rest goes up, uh, but we decided to do it differently. So we have the collective spaces weaving through the building. Um, these are the collective spaces for everyone, but every floor also has their own uh, collective uh, kitchen, which uh, is connected to these this bigger spaces. And here you have a bit of a picture of how that looks uh, from the side. Um, sustainability has been a very important topic for us. A lot of people, involved in this project have a background in sustainability science or working in their, in that field. So in terms of materials, we tried to use as much wood as possible, a lot of recycled uh, wood also from 
old uh, poles and old ship deck. Um, um, energy, we try to really uh, be as sustainable as possible with our own heat and cold storage system, solar panels. In terms of biodiversity, we try to contribute with the green facade and really also in, in, in the house, create a lot of green space. And then in terms of water, we really try to make it rain proof, which was also a requirement of the, system, the municipality. Um, I won't go over all of that in detail. Here you see some examples of the materials we used, uh, reused uh, um, to, 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 to make uh, the facade. Um, so that is how it will look. This, these are, will also be all recycled materials. In terms of water, we have an extensive water uh, uh, retention plan. In terms of energy, we have big um, uh, warmth cold storage into uh, the poles which the uh, building rests on. We have extensive plans for food and organic uh, waste and how to use that in our garden and in our roof terrace. And then there's a lot of attention for biodiversity and uh, attracting different types of birds and bats and bees. Uh, um, there's a lot of biologists in our group as well. Uh, this is a picture of how the roof terrace looks in the mind of the architect. Um, this is the, the garden uh, and the back uh, side of the building where you have different balconies which connect the different uh, communal kitchens. Uh, and this is um, a render of how the the communal um, uh, area will look like uh, the central area where, where everyone comes together. Um, now we are actually in the phase that it, this is becoming reality. So this is where the building is now. Um, um, all the floors are there. We start to uh, see more and more of the wooden uh, uh, walls also uh, being installed at this moment but we still need another four or five months until the building is complete. Um, and yeah, this is really the time that we are quite amazed that within a period of five, six uh, years uh, from just starting to dream with a big group, uh, we're actually in a phase that it has become reality and we can start living the dream. Um, Thanks very much for um, being able to, uh, to tell this story here and I'm looking forward to the other contributions. Thank you so much, Justin. Thank you to Sara and Adria. You really kept the 10 minutes <laughs> really disciplined. <laughs> so we will be able to, to do this. Um, I would now ask uh, Professor Rivka Ban and uh, Professor Tiago Costella to, uh, to make some uh, brief remarks, uh, comments on these uh, presentations. And uh, I will ask uh, who's, who's watching this debate, if you want to make any questions, please send by the chat. I will try to, uh, to put them all together. If you want to ask something to Sara, Adria, just to the Professor Eves or Professor Tiago Castella, uh, please just put on the chat. So Professor Eves? Yeah. Ica Ban? Yes. Right. <laughs> Please, you have the floor. So, um, well, hi, everybody. And thanks for inviting me to come in. Uh, I want to say hello as well. I'm speaking from Seville to the students from the master course uh, that uh, I invited to join this session in order to learn from you. And tomorrow, during a workshop, we react and deepen uh, this uh, the exercise. And I hope that I can feed you back with the students on what you are doing. Now about my comments very quickly. First, it is very inspiring. I mean, let's, let's be extremely clear about what was presenting in the three things. I wanted to uh, reflect on the following. Over the last 15 years, within the uh, Habitat Award, the UN Habitat Award, if that is awarding you know, the best projects in the world, we have, and I'm part of the jury, uh, we've been uh, able and I've been pushing very hardly to, uh, very hard 
to get community land trust, co-housing, these sort of initiatives being there. Not only because I believe this is interesting, but uh, because uh, you are opening new grounds. Once it's legitimated, you cannot imagine the impact the community land trust of Burlington when it was awarded uh, could uh, open as a space. Uh, the same for the cooperative housing from, um, from Latin America that uh, Adrian was referring to. It exists in 15, in 15 countries. So my invitation is, uh, especially to you, just keep on pushing and lobbying to be part of that. Um, La Borda and Adrien were part of the finalists, and I come back to that. So congratulations to, you know, I mean, a couple of years ago. So this is an important sector, as Sarah was saying, but we need to lobby internationally. And with that sort of example, it's to be done, you know, so as a group, we need this. Now, there is one concern which was raised, uh, I mean, internationally, and which is part of the debate is the capacity of co-op housing, co-housing, community land trust, whatever. I mean, the whole family of solutions that, that Sarah was referring to, to what extent they are able to be heterogeneous, to include migrants, refugees, homeless, the bottom part of, uh, of, uh, of the income earners, you know, single women, artists, etc. you know, a whole section of the most vulnerable or the, the those very far from accessing housing. And that, as a matter of fact, was one of the observation with La Borda, you know, and it's a little bit my observation to you just in the sense that this is a very homogeneous group, great strength, and I'm quite happy, you know, for having 40 years in that story to see young people, creative, uh, new, being there, you know, th this is very nice. But at the same time, and even in other experiences we, we, we had in, in Holland, uh, there is a divide between housing for the homeless on the one hand and co-op housing. And it was the same in the 60s in, in, uh, in Uruguay, you know, it never went very down. Same with community land trust. When I went to Burlington, we had that discussion. It's very difficult to have mixed groups in terms of income, even if nobody is rich. Uh, this is very clear, okay? Uh, never, and uh, diverse groups of nationalities, etc. And this is where I invite you to have a look at the uh, CLTB in, in uh, Belgium, that I'm sure that you know, uh, Gert and Joaquin and all the, the, these colleagues, that have been able, as a matter of fact, to get a CLT with multiple nations, you know, few people which were born. So that's one part of the story to me uh, of diversity, income, racial, etc. Okay. Is it a model that can be inclusive and to what extent? It's an open question and an open comment. Another aspect that uh, is being a lot discussed is it's about housing. And I was glad to hear that uh, you made this effort uh, just when you were saying about these collective spaces and you mentioned co-working. And Adrien was referring to the link with ESS, you did uh, solidarity economy, which is part of the equation. But uh, what is at stake is if we can, could have co-ops, which would be at the same time working places, not only for you as, uh, as members, but for the rest of the city to be hubs for new forms of production, for urban agriculture, for, for lots of other things, you know, which could be done. So the relation of job related co-ops and housing co-ops and how can they merge, it's, it's, a, it's another key comment I want to make, because when you look the co-op movement in, uh, for, for jobs, you know, in the social economy, they are there, okay? And the housing co-ops are there. It's, when I speak with my colleagues in the, uh, you know, small enterprise co-ops, et cetera, they are not merging. 
And so I think that this is a bridge that we need to think about, you know. Um, I would stop here. I think that uh, we had a couple of minutes, didn't we? And I would come back to community land trust, which is something which is more closer to my activities for, for the last, I mean, for, for a couple of years. And I'm part of the collective internationally. So when we discuss the other, the, the second half, maybe I can say a few words on the importance of a community land trust and uh, highlight some differences with the co-op model and some advantages to the to the co-op model well thanks again uh, this is very short and so inspiring you know you made my day i must say okay. <laughs> thank you so much professor Rivkaban, for uh, for these comments and yes it's been a very interesting debate so now tiago please you have the floor uh, thank you, Anna, and for your very kind introduction. Uh, I also want to say that it, it was a pleasure to, to hear Professor Caban's uh, comments. You know, I hadn't been in an event with him for many years now, and it's great to see him again. Uh, as as uh, Professor Caban said, you know, these this were three very inspiring presentations. You know, uh, the overview that Sarah provided on also this amazing uh, um experiments that uh, adria and and just shared with us it's it's really really um you know you it's made me very optimistic about uh, the futures of a house housing in europe you know the, the possibilities that they show and you know it's uh, i i saw it as kind of actualizing the proposal of the feminist geographers you know gibson graham of constructing a language of economic diversity um in the political economy of housing you know showing that there are, you know even though there is a dominance of uh capitalist modes of production in housing in in uh, in europe and elsewhere you know there are other ways uh of of uh, of doing housing you know both uh in terms of creating it and and of dwelling uh and uh, i think the presentations were also very interesting because they showed how this is not just a question of uh, the initiative of certain groups, but there, there are certain conditions like legal changes, um, you know, funding by credit unions or, or, uh, uh, or uh, public funding, or in, in the case of the Netherlands by uh, broader national policies. You know, and of course, there's a relation with activism, you know, the, these changes didn't come about, you know, uh, by chance, but but we all we also have to think that there's this relation between uh, housing activism and uh, the necessary changes for these experiments to to happen. Um, you know, I am an, a historian, so my comments uh, will, will be mostly thinking on on um, uh, on 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 the history of cooperative housing. So. Um, first of all, the first comment that I would do is, uh, you know, for the Portuguese scholars and activists here in the group, I think we need to learn from the history of the political economy of housing in Portugal. I mean, we had a very rich history of corporate housing, more or less from between 1950 from to 1980, that was partly enabled by, by national policies, of course, different bef before 74 and after, but then we had, you know, an erosion of corporate housing as a, a possibility of production and dwelling, um, you know, by the increased focus of both the state and the newly privatized banks on subsidized mortgages for home ownership, you know, by individuals and households. So, um, and which also produced change subjectivities around the issue of housing. Which, which make it difficult, you know, for, for these kinds of experiments to, to you know, uh, have, have a relevant scale uh, at the national level, possibly. You know, and some, some references, you know, there's the seminal articles by Silva Pereira in 1963, published in the Analyse Social, and also the more recent book chapter by Patricia Sancho Pedrosa in the book that the Housing Institute published in, in 2018. I think we could, uh, you know, these are two examples in, in big cities. I think we have to look at the possibilities of, of cooperative housing 
in uh, smaller cities, towns, villages. Um, one very interesting European history is the example of the Castor, the Beavers, uh, cooperative housing associations in France, which still exist today. I wrote a little bit about it a few years ago, but I never got funding for that research that I wanted to do. Um, but it's a really, really uh, interesting example of these small scale building co-ops that exist were more about collective self-building back in the 60s and now are more about you know technical systems uh, for, for self-managed housing uh, and of course i mean and one last comment is that we have to be very careful about you know the politics of housing because this can be transformed very quickly i was reminded of gail radford's book modern housing in america in which she shows all the wonderful experiments with, with forms of co-housing and cooperative housing in the 1920s and early 1930s in the United States. And then she shows how the Wagner Act, you know, which was part of the New Deal in 1937, actually kind of destroyed the possibilities of, of cooperative housing for a long time. And now more recently, of course, as uh, Professor Caban mentioned, we have, we have some transformations in the states but you know I was just remembering the Wagner Act I think is important and how the New Deal affected housing for you know there can be you know um, moments of great creativity that are crushed you know by by national decisions regarding you know uh, housing policy state funding and so on and so forth uh, so to just to conclude because I've already talking for six minutes now um, you know, we need to uh, really push for EU and national policies in national policies in the country where these are more or less stagnant, like in Portugal. And there, you know, we need to be concerned with state funding and also the fostering of credit unions, which is something, I mean, in Portugal, basically have the credit agricola and that's it. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, Tiago, um, for these comments and remarks. Um, we have uh, uh, two questions on the chat, actually three questions. <laughs> we have uh, two questions from uh, Bernard Walsh. Um, he's asking, um, how do you choose the persons that will have a house on the cooperative? And how do you calculate the rent of each household? It is it is it according accordingly to the income of the family or any other way? And then we have a question of Nuno Patricio. He gives congratulations to all the speakers. And he says, I would like to hear a little more about the different social profiles, wage levels, savings, age, gender, nationalities uh, of the cases, and ask the Portuguese participants which social profiles these kinds of models can attend in Portugal. So I think this question is for uh, uh, Tiago and, and Sara. So, Maybe I would uh, I would give the word back to uh, Sara, and then we go to Adria. Just and if Professor Yves Caban and Tiago also want to add something else, I will just ask you to be really really short in order not to get this <laughs> this first part too long. So Sara, go. <laughs> Can you please repeat the question? I didn't get it. Okay, uh, you have to, uh, two questions mostly um, about uh, uh, the idea how people are chosen to be a part of the cooperative and how rent is calculated for each household and also in Portugal which social profiles this kind of models could uh, provide uh, uh, housing solutions. Okay, so for the first I think I will, I will leave Adria and just to give their concrete examples um, in the case of Portugal, well, I think this can be a good starting point of the second part of the debate. Um, from my side, I mainly uh, introduced a general overview of the many European uh, initiatives. So for, for the specific um, case of Portugal, I think um, we, should, we should consider 
mainly two two different kind of cooperative development. So first, more oriented to the middle class, let's say, who can actually self-organize and conduct the whole process themselves without the actual need of municipal support or or whatever. And then we have uh, an, another discussion, which is how can we incorporate the the the, co uh, the cooperative sector. And how can we create this kind of collaborations with uh, the municipalities? And I think um, both uh, the example of La Borda and the, the, the Varen provide good ideas of how can we actually um, can use these models in, in the Portuguese context because it's possible. So we have the, 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 the surface rights that the municipalities can work with. Uh, the, the the actual legal frameworks. I think it's basically prepared to 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 deal with this. So it's only a matter of of uh, re, re, revisiting the, the the laws that we have and the actual mm -hmm. instruments and make it make it happen. Uh, mainly for the the yeah for the low income and medium income families. I would say. Adria. You want to talk us about the experience of Laborda? Sure, sure. Um, so the two questions, uh, how do we choose people? Basically, it's uh, there's two ways. One is um, you need to be on the on the list of social housing. So you need to be on the public list, the government of Catalonia, basically, with some criteria of um, you know income and so on and so forth. And then basically yeah, just signing up to the cooperative. In this case of La Borda, they just made an open call in the neighborhood uh, where people went to the meeting and then they had a list that, that you basically wrote and show interest and, and from that. Uh, so usually it's like this, it's like uh, by, by affinity, a group forms, they work, they create a vision, and then when it's a bit more work, they open up in a public call. And of course, it's basically through more affinity networks, but sometimes there's some, some randomness as well. But that's usually how it goes, so the, 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 two, the two ways. And uh, um, the payments, <clears throat> how is it decided? In La Borda, what we did, uh, we collectively uh, decided that the average payment uh, for for square meter will be uh, no more than 30% of the minimum salary of Catalonia, uh, which basically it was just, of course, a symbolic, but in a way is we try to follow this kind of UN recommendation of not, not devoting too much or oh, more than 30%, uh, which means that uh, this, let's say some, uh, the smaller apartments, uh, they, they pay less than the bigger apartments because you pay by square meter. Um, but that was uh, um, the idea. We don't check on people's real incomes, um, but we, we, we do follow, um, let's say, the, the, the average on the country. Then we have solidarity mechanisms within the, uh, within the payments um, that are not uh, in terms of balancing the payment based on income. Uh, but uh, in case you have problems to pay, uh, we have a, a solidarity uh, a safety box, basically, that uh, the cooperative pays several months in case you cannot uh, um, without returning it, basically. And then uh, if it uh, prolongs, yeah, let's say your situation uh, prolongs, then uh, it goes into a more like a, like a loan without interest. Thank you, Adria. Just Obrigado. give us uh, your experience. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for these great uh, questions. Uh, I think very valuable. I think there's a lot of potential for housing cooperatives to contribute to uh, diversity, integration, to uh, create a different dynamic within a city, to interact with the neighborhood and create places to work together and, and create new initiatives. So uh, thanks for that perspective. I think our starting point um, uh, for the Vara was a bit different. We didn't come from, uh, let's say, uh, a social movement background, but we were a group of um, creatives, friends, um, who really had this dream of living together uh, and who were already for a long time involved in um, organizing events, music events, festivals, uh, creative spaces throughout the city for a long time. And I think um, having that um, very connected group 
of people um, has really helped us through a very difficult process. So um, there have been many moments where we felt like, will we still continue? It's, it, it has been really difficult to organize a housing project like this, which both wants to have affordable housing, it wants to be very sustainable, and we want to have a lot of space for community interaction and organize that community in a way that, that goes well. So uh, I think there's also, uh, you can't on, take on the whole world if you're doing a project like this, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, when the project is there, you, you cannot add new objectives or new values to, to what you want to do. Um, so that's, that's one thing I think, um, in terms of the pricing of the, the houses, it's similar. So the, the different houses are based on the, the different rents are based on the, on the size. Um, uh, but, um, uh, uh, I think about half of our, uh, of our apartments, they are social housing. Uh, and with the rents, we have really done our best to make the business case in a way that our rents are lower than the average in Amsterdam, and also that the, the rents will not increase as much as the rents elsewhere in Amsterdam will do. So over time, rents will, relative to other rents in Amsterdam, even become cheaper, and also at some point time in the future, then we have paid off the mortgage of the of the house, which also means that that frees up extra space, which can even lower the rents further. So I think um, we're really doing our best uh, to cater for this diverse group of people in terms of income, yeah, because there's people with very low budgets and people with slightly higher budgets to really make affordable housing a possibility in Amsterdam. Um, and we're looking forward to work more with the neighborhood and, and create more diversity within our group. Um, but first we want to have the house uh, there. Thank you, just, I see that Adria wants to add something. Go yeah, ahead. just just um, just to mention it because I wrote it in the chat and maybe it got lost. That uh, regarding inclusivity, uh, thank you for the question because it's a central question uh, for the development of the sector right now. We just released a report um, where we studied uh, economic inclusion and 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 also from origin and other I don't know gender and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and uh, we found out that 30% uh, of, uh, of people of the, that is living or going to live in the cooperative housing are migrants. Um, so it's still too wide, let's say. Um, but um, but yeah, like like uh, there's also like uh, particularities because half of these migrants come from Spain, uh, which of course we're supposedly the same country, but there's also uh, you, you know different uh, differences within the country that uh, that. We consider themselves uh, also migrants and so on and so forth. So uh, for a regular, let's say, situation in other countries, maybe 50%, let's say. Um, but the whole point is that uh, this topic is becoming uh, central. We just working right now. We, for instance, I'm going to type it here. We're going to release a, a new uh, community infrastructure. That it's, that it's a solidarity fund. It's going to be uh, funding uh, includes um, social flats let's say so that in we, we're establishing a, a strategy that in each new building at least we have one social flat that people that usually do not get into these projects because they don't have the economic or uh, socioeconomic networks or other uh, exclusion mechanisms can can join the projects so uh, it's a long thing to say basically but but it's it's a central topic and and thank you for raising the the, the topic thank you so much adria so I think we have finished this first part of our debate. Um, I would like to actually to, to invite Adria and just maybe for just is a little bit more difficult. We will continue the conversation in Portuguese. Um, I don't know if just can follow Portuguese, but maybe Adria can keep up with us <laughs> or maybe not. He has something else to do, of course. 
Um, so I just want to thank you, say thanks to Sara, to Adria, to just to Professor Yves Caban uh, and to Tiago for this uh, first part of the debate, for their contributions, their comments. We will now switch to, to Portuguese. I don't know if you all need to, I don't know, spread your legs, uh, take a glass of water, take two minutes and then we restart. Uh, maybe, maybe just uh, <laughs> just go and have a, a cigarette <laughs> and, and then we come back in uh, one, two minutes for the second part. We have this planned. So I see you in, in, in two minutes, okay? And thank you, everybody. Okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thanks. <laughs> I will actually uh, leave the call now, but uh, watch the rest of the recording later when I'm able and see how far my Portuguese will reach. Um, but I wish you all a, a good uh, second half of the session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone.